Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me so much pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of India Habitat Center and Mr. Binoy K. Behel. Over the past four decades, art historian, filmmaker, and photographer Binoy K. Behel has repeatedly traveled to all corners of India and through the many countries of Asia to document art and cultural heritage. In fact, the Limka Book of Records for the past 20 years has been giving him the record for being the most traveled art historian. The breadth of his vast coverage has given a new perspective to the understanding of Indian cultural history. Phenomena which sometimes may have appeared isolated or comparatively unexplained are often better understood and seen in their true cultural context through his broad ranging vision. The Trans Himalayan region is a vast area which Mr. Behel has visited almost 30 times over the past many years. He is the person who has documented all the remains of the chain of 108 monasteries which were made across the Trans Himalayas in the 10th to the 11th centuries. The film which he shares with us today, Monasteries of Printing Zampo, is one of the treasures of his distilled knowledge of Buddhist culture in this high altitude region. This is the 13th event in the series, Glimpses of Culture. Over to Mr. Benoit K. Behel now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be with you again. My many thanks to the India Habitat Center for this occasion yet again to share uh, some beautiful uh, aspects of the uh, cultural heritage of this vast uh, subcontinent. It is indeed uh, a wonderful uh, collaboration which uh, the India Habitat Center has done. My many thanks to uh, Doordarshan, who have over the years sponsored the making of my numerous films, which are deeply researched and all about uh, art heritage. In a world which is uh, so driven by commercial interests, it is indeed remarkable of this public service broadcaster to have uh, done this and I am deeply grateful to them. Ladies and gentlemen, we spoke previously in this uh, series of talks about uh, Asanga and Vasu Bandhu, who began the Yogacara school of Buddhism in Kashmir in the fourth century. Thereafter, in the eighth century, Guru Padmasambhav took the developed form of this uh, school of Buddhism now called the Vajrayana, to the Trans-Himalayan uh, region. And the, that was the first great coming of Buddhism to that region. And the second great coming of Buddhism was when uh, 108 monasteries are believed to have been established across this vast, cold, desert, bleak, inhospitable region by... Uh, the great translator, Rinchen Zangpo. And these were uh, all painted and sculpted and made by uh, artists from the Valley of Kashmir who were invited uh, for the purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, the art within these monasteries is some of the finest art ever of humankind. And what makes it uh, immensely valuable in so many ways is also the fact that uh, the early paintings of the wonderful painters of Kashmir have not survived at all, except for those that were made in this uh, trans Himalayan region. And therefore, they are the surviving jewels 
of one of the greatest traditions of painting of the world. The art of the Kashmiri painters is filled with the joy and beauty of that valley of Kashmir. It is indeed especially joyous and very graceful. It reminds us always with its lyrical grace that there is an end to the sorrow of the world. And this immensely beautiful art is to be found within uh, these uh, exquisite uh, remains of these monasteries. And it has been a great pleasure for me to have spent much time, in fact, uh, for many years, the trans himalayan region has almost been like a second home to me. And I've had, uh, I've had great joy in being with, uh, with the people of that region who are uh, away to some extent, at least, in fact, to quite a great extent away from the noise and clamor of the material world, which besets us so much in the, uh, in the plains. I remember the time when uh, every other person on the street there used to have a prayer wheel in their hand and their thoughts were elsewhere. Their thoughts were a little beyond purely material concerns. Their prayers were for things like, uh, for instance, the uh, insects they may have inadvertently killed while plowing their fields. It was a value, that it was a value-driven culture, a culture in which goodness was recognized, a culture in which, in fact, goodness was essential for social interaction and bringing you some of these films reminds me so much of uh, the joy of being in that place. So let me share this film with you and uh, Sushant, uh, I would request you to kindly run the film. Thank you so much. <laughs> Over the past 31 years, I've had the joy of traveling repeatedly to many corners of this vast subcontinent that is India. It is amazing to see how landscapes, culture, food, music, dances, and even languages change every few hundred kilometers that you drive. You see the highest mountains of the world, great seas, bountiful rivers, and best of all, a people whose thoughts and heritage go back a few thousand years. Join us on an enthralling journey. I am traveling again across the whole of India to bring you spectacular India. The lands just beyond the Himalayas are a vast and cold desert. The region is surrounded by some of the tallest mountains of the world and is very thinly populated. This high and arid land consists of Ladakh, Lahore Spiti and Kinnor on the Indian side and of Tibet. We are at Zojila Pass at 11,400 feet altitude. It is through here that Buddhism and Buddhist culture spread from Kashmir twice to Ladakh, Lahore Spiti, Kinnor, and to Tibet. The first great diffusion of Buddhism to these areas was in the 8th century, when the great Guru Padma Sambhava spread Buddhism. The second great diffusion of Buddhism in the Trans-Himalayas 
was when Rinchen Zangpo from Tibet came to Kashmir to bring back the true knowledge of Buddhism. In the 8th century, Shantarakshita from Nalanda University brought Buddhism to Tibet. However, he found that the people continued to live in fear of evil spirits and would not easily take to the new faith. In 747 AD, Shantarakshita requested the king to invite Guru Padmasambhava, also of the Nalanda University, to Tibet to help to spread the Buddhist faith. The dramatic story of Padmasambhava's conversion of the people of these lands to Buddhism is one of the great epics of the world. The Guru swept across the mountains, performing the Cham or the monastic dance of the Lamas. He purified the land and made it ready for Buddhism. From 836 to 842 AD came a dark period in the history of Buddhism in Tibet. King Lang Dharma opposed the new religion and persecuted Buddhists. Buddhist scriptures were burnt, monks killed, and temples were razed to the ground. We are divided this Tibetan into two phases. It has a, a reason behind this is when the Lang Dharma has destroyed Buddhism. Destroyed means virtually he has destroyed the monasteries and the monks. So, in between, it is said on the basis of the uh, narratives given by one of the ladies that almost 70 or 75 years, she says, at the time she was of the 75 years, she says, I have never ever seen a single monk or nun. So therefore, he, he presumes probably over 80, 80 or the 90 years now, there was no Buddhism at all in Tibet. So this is the gap in which Buddhism was not prevalent. When King Yeshe O came to the throne of Guge in 947 AD, his kingdom consisted of the present Indian territories of Ladakh, Lahol, Spiti and Kinnor, and Guge and Purang in western Tibet. By then, Buddhism had declined in the Trans Himalayas. What troubled the king most was that even the little practice of the religion, which continued, was decadent and full of magical practices. Around 975 AD, the king sent 21 young scholars to Kashmir, which was then one of the greatest centers of Buddhism. Their mission was to learn about the faith and to bring back knowledge and scriptures. These young men set out full of zeal, but the journey was long and difficult. Nineteen of them died in the travel to and from Kashmir. Two scholars survived the journey to Kashmir and came back after 17 years. One of these two was Rinchen Zangpo. He was to become famous for all time to come as Lutsava, the great translator. He translated the Sanskrit texts which he had brought from Kashmir into Tibetan. Rinchen Zangpo also supervised the construction of many monasteries and temples. These became exquisite jewels of the faith, set in the midst of the vast spaces of the Trans-Himalayan desert. हम लोचावा रिंचेन जंपो को बहुत बहुत नमस्कार करते हैं छक्साल बोलते हैं और जुले बोलते हैं लोचावा रिंचेन जंपो जीज ने हमारे लद्दाख को बनाया लद्दाख के कल्चर को आर्ट को शुरू की द सेकंड ग्रेट डिफ्यूजन ऑफ बुद्धिज्म इन द ट्रांस हिमालयस व्हिच वाज बिगन बाय किंग येशे ओ एंड रिंचेन जंपो 
was a dawn of faith on the roof of the world. The light of knowledge which they brought was to continue forever in these vast regions. One hundred and eight monasteries are believed to have been constructed in this period in the kingdom of Gugge, in western Tibet, Ladakh, Lohol Spiti and Kinnor. The people believe that the monasteries of Rinchen Zangpo were created miraculously in one night. Villagers awoke in the morning and discovered a beautiful temple there. Truly, the making of these temples in a short time and across vast distances must have appeared to be a miracle. Rinchen Zangpo has been transformed in the minds of the people from a historical figure to a supernatural being who performed miracles. Alchi points ke wo wahan ka jo pani dekhta hai to wo bolta hai yahan kuch gaon zarur basayenge. To mera ummeed hai ki ye me safed dande ko jo sukha hua danda hai usko wahan par laga dete hain. Agar is jagah pe koi gonpa banana ho ya banna ho to mere wapas aane tak इस डंडे को पत्ते निकाल आएंगे ऐसा उसने पूजा करके उस डंडे को जमीन में गाड़ दिया और उसके बाद वो मांगड़ियों चले गए जब वो आलची वापस जाते हैं तो इसने जो डंडा सफेद डंडा और सूखा डंडा उसने जमीन में गाड़ा था तो उसको पत्ता निकाल आए थे तो लोचावा जी ने ये सोचा कि हाँ ये तो वाकई बहुत ही नेक शगुन होगा तो यहाँ भी हम एक गोंदपा बनाएंगे तो लोचावा जी का एक खासियत ये थे कि उसकी आंख बहुत ही तेज़ था और उसमें कुछ थे कुछ हमसे अलग थे तो उसका जो आंख का पलक है जो वो नीचे से ऊपर दबाते थे जिस तरह गंदी जी बहुत तेज़ चलते थे उसी तरह लोचावा जी भी बहुत तेज़ चलते थे जिससे हम कंगज बोलते हैं उसका मतलब ये है कि हम एक दिन अगर एक दिन में पहुँचते हैं तो लोचावा जी एक घंटे में वहाँ पहुँच जाते थे उससे हम कंगज बोलते हैं तो हमारे बुज़ुर्ग ये बोलते हैं कि आलची मांगू और सुंदा तीनों को एक ही दिन में उनमें पूजा की थी तो सुंदा वाले कहते हैं हमको भी दर्शन हुए आलची वाले कहते हैं नहीं नहीं वहाँ नहीं हो सकते वहाँ तो लोचावा तो हमारे यहाँ आते तो जब लोगों ने आपस में बातें करना शुरू किया तो लोचावा रिंचन साहब जो कंग थे उसमें वो हम तो जादू तो नहीं बोलेंगे आप वो तो रिलीजस का एक क्या बोलते स्परिचुअल ताकत उसमें थे तो वो ताकत यूज करके वो तीनों जगह पहुंच गए किंग यशो एंड सब्सिक्वेंट किंग्स हु पेट्रोनाइज द मेकिंग ऑफ दीज मॉनेस्ट्रीज इनवाइटेड आर्टिस्ट फ्रॉम कश्मीर दीज मास्टर्स फ्रॉम कश्मीर सुपरवाइज द बिल्डिंग ऑफ द मॉनेस्ट्रीज एंड मेड द ब्यूटीफुल पेंटिंग्स एंड स्कल्पचर्स इनसाइड देम The painters and sculptors from Kashmir brought with them a highly sophisticated form of art which was deeply rooted in the classic Indian traditions. The masters from Kashmir would have also trained local artists who spread the knowledge and artistic styles. We are at the Alchi Temple complex about 74 kilometers west of Leh. This is one of the original 108 monasteries which were founded under the supervision of Rinchen Zangpo in the 10th and 11th centuries. We are in front of the Sumsthik or three-story temple of Alchi. This has inside it some of the most beautiful paintings of mankind. These were made by Kashmiri artists who were invited for the purpose. In fact the wood carving of the temple was also done by the Kashmiri artists and this is very typically in the style of Kashmir in that period. Since ancient times the hallmark of the finest Indian art was the deep and inward look on the faces of the figures. The art of these monasteries continues the sublime tradition. What makes the paintings and sculptures here unique is a lilting grace which awakens a sense of joy within us. 
the art of these early trans-Himalayan monasteries takes us far from the noise and clamour of the material world. Mythical creatures with riders trampling upon fierce animals are a constant motif in medieval Indian art. They represent the courage within us, with which we must face the demons of our ignorance and confusion. While deities present the sublime message of the peace to be found within us, the Kashmiri artist never forgets the joy of worship. The purpose of this art is to elevate us to a world permeated with the joy of divinity. We are in the remote village of Mangyu, about 23 kilometers west of Alchi. Today it was easy to get here because in 2006 a motorable road was made reaching this village. Before that, one had to walk 14 kilometers uphill along a mountain stream to reach here. This monastery has many beautiful paintings and sculptures inside, which are closely similar to those at Alchi. In fact, it seems that the same artists could have made those at Alchi and those here. The monastery of Mangyu is another one of the original 108 monasteries which were made in the time of Rinchen Zangpo. This monastery has a large stupa inside which are made exquisite paintings and sculptures. The three monasteries of Alchi, Mangyu and Sumda are most beloved to the people of Ladakh. It was also believed that if in the course of one day a person could visit all three monasteries, he would get instant nirvan. Now this did not uh, used to be possible. I remember the last time when I came to Sumda, it was 35 kilometers of steep uphill walking. Now that has changed. You see the road behind me, this heads towards Sumda and takes one within three kilometers of the monastery. Mangyu also has a road which goes right up to the village. I wonder if Nirvan would still be possible if one took a motor car and went to all three places in one day. This is Mr. Tashi Tundup. He is a resident of Thikse, which is right next to the ancient site of Nyarma. Nyarma is the oldest monastic site of Ladakh. There is an inscription in the Alchi Monastery, the famous Alchi Monastery, of one Kalden Sherap. Kalden Sherap was the founder of Alchi, and he says that he had already studied at Nyarma. This is <laughs> मैं तो ये बाप दादा के जमाने में यहां पे हूं ये जगह तो बहुत पवित्र स्थान है ये जगह तो बहुत टाइम में यहां आ चुका हूं यहां कुछ ये नानरी भी है बना हुआ है तो ये एक तो खासकर ये लोचा और इंचन जंपो का ये यहां पे बना हुआ जो के पीछे देख रहा है ये यरमा तो ये बहुत पुराना स्थान है it's quite wonderful to see how even ruined sites like Nyarma have treasures of art hidden within them. When I came here for the first time five years ago, this broken looking Chortan had a small little entrance near the ground. In fact, I remember I had to lie down on my tummy and somehow wriggle inside this Chortan. And inside, were beautiful paintings of around the 13th century. Inside this Chortan are such beautiful bodhisattvas painted with hands of devotion. Despite the crumbling condition today, the remains of temples and stupas 
evoke a sense of the original grandeur and scale of this magnificent site. The Tabo Choskhor or Temple Complex in Spiti in Himachal Pradesh is among the three oldest monasteries which were built by Rinchen Zangpo. The other two are Nyarma in Ladakh and Tholing Monastery in Tibet. What a time it must have been when the king Yeshe O and Rinchen Zangpo were filled with zeal to spread the Indian philosophy which Rinchen Zangpo had brought from Kashmir. A philosophy which saw the material world around us as Maya, an illusion. The purpose was always to lift the veils of that illusion, to be able to see the eternal truth beyond, the truth of the oneness of all that there is. The exquisite clay sculptures and paintings upon the walls of this Dukhang were made by Kashmiri artists and perhaps by others who were trained by them. They display that same exquisite quality of art which we have seen in the monasteries of Ladakh of that period. This deity Vajralasya expresses the quality of grace which is at the heart of all that there is in the world. The art strips away the veils of illusion of the material world to present this inherent beauty. As we look upon and perceive the gentle graciousness of the deities, we awaken that same within us. This is a, a segment from the uh, one of the original doorways of the Tabo Choskhor temple complex. This uh, exquisite uh, wooden sculpture is in the uh, typical style of Kashmir of that period. The Bodhisattva made out here, the way that his uh, pectoral muscles are made, the uh, triple uh, pointed crown, these are typical of the art of Kashmir. And these are to be found in the doorways of all the temples which were made at that time. The Lahlung temple is on a high hill not very far from Tabo. It is also of the period of the second diffusion of Buddhism. Coming into the temple, one is surrounded by the beauty and blessings of the deities. One has left the mundane world behind to enter the realm of grace. The Lama Yuru Monastery is made at a spectacular location with windswept craggy mountains all around. It is about 127 kilometers west of Leh. This is one of the oldest monasteries in Ladakh. It has one room, a Verochna Lakhang, which belongs to the 11th century, the period of Rinchen Zangpo. King Yesheo and the great translator Rinchen Zangpo wished to re-establish the Buddhist faith in the Trans Himalayas. They also wanted to ensure that it was true knowledge that would form the basis of this renaissance. In Buddhism, the cult of Verochana was then prominent across India, especially in Kashmir. Rinchen Zangpo had studied scriptures related to Verochana during the time he spent in Kashmir. We are in the Verochana Lakhang the temple to Verochana in the Lama Yuru Monastery. These beautiful clay sculptures here were made in the 10th and 11th century by Kashmiri artists. It is shrines to Verochana which are made in all the temples which were founded in the time of Rinchen Zangpo. Even today, Rinchen Zangpo uh, plays a very, uh, very great role in the spiritual uh, area spiritual field of uh, Himalayan Buddhism. Uh, reason, first reason being uh, the, the re-embodiment of the Rinchen Zampo still continues. You know. uh, President Rinchen Zampo, uh, Lochen uh, Kelsen Tuku, uh, Tenzin Kelsen Tuku, which we call him, you know, uh, he is uh, from the Shalkar village, which is in Kinnaur district. 
these temples, you can find many uh, different statues and uh, uh, wall paintings uh, still remaining. The experts, the, they say these are uh, the Kashmiri style, uh, similar to uh, maybe many temples that you might you may find in Kashmir. Rinchen Zambo, uh, he studied in Kashmir actually. There was uh, Buddhism in Kashmir and um, uh, the, maybe great universities were there and great scholars were there. So he mainly studied Buddhism uh, and Sanskrit in Kashmir. So uh, when he built those temples, he uh, brought uh, artists from Kashmir. The experience of joy lies at the heart of the Buddhism which came to the Trans Himalayas during the second diffusion. The concept of yoga stresses the oneness of everything in creation. This art, permeated with a sublime sense of grace, brings the worshipper closer to that ecstatic realization. My many thanks to uh, Sujata Chatterjee, who makes it possible to do for me to do whatever that I do. Thank you so much. It is this uh, joy which is at the heart of the Buddhist experience that we receive from the uh, from the painters of Kashmir. It is a joy that transcends. It is a joy which helps us to obliterate the uh, uh, pains and desires of the material world to help us to achieve the shunyata or the emptiness of all the, of all the material forms, of all the material desires which keep us bound to our existence in the world. It is a joy which helps us to fly. And truly, in all the art of the world, it is difficult to find uh, an experience of joy which compares with that of the Kashmiri artists. I would be very happy to uh, answer uh, the questions if you have them. Thank you. I must also share with you the experience of the Sia, the uh, wild rose of the Trans Himalayas, that in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the arid surroundings, uh, bursts forth in uh, a wonderful, delicate, beautiful pink color and spreads an immense amount of its perfume generously into the air, sharing its uh, joy with all of us. And indeed, in the middle of this desert, uh, such a strong uh, smell being wafted abroad from this wonderful uh, sia is for me uh, the most unforgettable and the most important part of my experience of uh, the trans Himalayan region. This joy also uh, reminds us of one of the fact that uh, Abhinav Gupta, one of the greatest uh, Indian philosophers of aesthetics lived in Kashmir and wrote in Kashmir uh, about a century before these uh, paintings that you saw today were made. And he, uh, a 
Abhinav Gupta is a person who wrote about how uh, the aesthetic experience, our response to something truly beautiful when we see it in nature or in art, is akin to Brahmananda or the final bliss of salvation itself. There are some comments. I thought I'll leave the, read them out before any questions come. Uh, Tara Hasnan says, lovely images, beautiful art and monasteries. Thank you, Benoy. Thank you so much, Tara. It is very kind of you. Meghna, awesome sharing, Benoyji. Thank you. Thank you. Kanaka Singham, thank you for the sharing, Mr. Benoy Behel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vipuda, another wonderful morning from Chicago. Thanks for this wonderful experience to Professor, Teacher Sri Binoy Behan. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. Godan Nambudripat, wonderful art, well preserved and brought to us by incredible Binoy Behan Ji. Very kind of you. It is so good to have you with us. Philip Martinez. The work of these Kashmiri artists is truly divine. The colors, the shapes, the facial expressions. Thanks for this unforgettable experience, Binoy. I am so glad that you enjoyed it. Well, I, uh, Inga Pogosian, thank you for this amazing movie and for inviting me to watch it. Tara Hasnan. Can you tell us a bit about how you got to reach some of these hard to reach monasteries in times past? Yes, yes. First, my thanks to Inga. And indeed, it was, uh, it was often a remarkable experience and uh, it, is part of, uh, it is part of the unforgettable experiences which uh, have made my life what it has been. Uh, uh, in fact, I do not uh, acclimatize very well to uh, low oxygen uh, conditions. Therefore, for me, uh, visiting these places is uh, as difficult as it is for anybody else. I'm not one of the people to whom it comes easily. So, the first uh, very remote place that uh, I visited was uh, Mangyu, which at that time was still uh, uh, a fairly long walk uh, next to a stream uh, to reach there. This is in Ladakh. And if you remember, this is one of the uh, important uh, monasteries of Rinch and Zangpo. And uh, since I was very afraid of uh, walking so much uh, in the low oxygen condition, I tried to arrange a horse to take me. No horses were available. Eventually only a donkey was found. And that was one occasion when uh, uh, I sat on a donkey. As it turns out, it was a very uncomfortable ride and I, I don't think it was much of the distance that I really sat uh, on that on that dear animal, but uh, uh, such was that uh, experience. The journey to Sumda was a much more difficult, uh, much longer uh, uphill uh, walk, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in various parts of, uh, uh, very remote parts of uh, Western Tibet uh, were some of my most uh, difficult uh, experiences because of uh, altitude uh, changes, even though they were uh, motorable roads, but the changes of altitude were, uh, were immense from night to night. So one had to be really careful, but all this all this care, all this uh, so-called difficulty was all, was all wrapped in uh, a cover of, uh, of beauty. All this was enhanced as if by the smell 
of the seer, the wild rose. And all this was part of a magical enchantment of being uh, in these areas. I'm reminded of uh, the uh, night spent at uh, Nako in uh, uh, an upper part of Kinor, where I had to uh, acclimatize uh, overnight also, because it was at 13,500 feet altitude. And uh, we were coming up from about, uh, I think we were coming up from about uh, only uh, 9,000 feet altitude or 10,000 feet altitude. So it was very important to acclimatize. And all night, one heard the wind blowing outside the windows. And all night, there was the sound of uh, animals, domesticated animals, the mooing of cows and the such like. Amazing experiences that uh, fill the mind, fill the mind with that uh, experience. And there are so many more and, and all of them, uh, the travel to these uh, exquisite little uh, jewels of the feet set next to uh, small valleys, which have some greenery in the middle of the Trans Himalayan desert. So thank you, Tara, for taking me on this uh, journey to answer you. Thank you very much. Uma Rudran saying, thanks, Mr. Behan. Truly in awe of your efforts and documentation and education. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. Arushi Bahuguna, thank you for a fantastic distillation of Buddhist culture in Ladakh and Tibet. Is there a Buddhist text on art that can give us a glimpse into how Kashmiri artists practiced and trained others in this art? Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for your appreciation. Um, there was no specific uh, Buddhist or Hindu or Jaina uh, tradition of art or uh, treaties. There is, uh, it was uh, guilds of artists who were present in, uh, in ancient India and they painted the themes of all the faiths. In fact, they were uh, very, very knowledgeable repositories of these themes and the details and the visuals which you find are represented in the art. They, they played a very important position uh, in society. They had a very important position in society and they fulfilled a very fundamental need for, as the Chitra Sutra also states, uh, art is the most valuable treasure of mankind, more valuable than uh, uh, gold or uh, jewels. So uh, there is not a specific uh, treatise like that, but there is the general treatise which covers uh, all forms of art, and that is the oldest known treatise that there is uh, in the world, the detailed treatise. It is the Chitra Sutra. And uh, there are, uh, there are records and writings about the fact that uh, the Kashmiri artists were invited by King Yeshio and Lutsawa in Chitrangpo and they came. And uh, we are also able to see the fact that they trained other uh, uh, painters, etc. Because we see it in the art we are able to discern the original painter's touch and then we are able to discern the uh, scores of years of paintings which follow in that tradition, beautifully capturing those themes of uh, grace. And yet one can make out the slight difference between the original artist and those who have been trained. And in Tibet, thereafter comes a stage where uh, the art is created by the Nepali artists uh, who uh, came there. And then uh, eventually there comes a period where the artists of uh, Tibet are found to be painting themselves. 
Thank you very much. Sandy Calabo. I hope I have the pronunciation right. If I don't, please forgive me. How have the colors and sculptures remained vibrant and beautiful over the years? Yes, Sandy, they are quite amazing, aren't they? And that is, I suppose, the, uh, the trick of the arid, extremely dry uh, climate of uh, the trans Himalayas. In fact, uh, it has been changing uh, gradually and uh, a few inches of rain in the year have started uh, falling. But uh, uh, previously, there was uh, hardly any rain at all. It was, there was no humidity and therefore it was, uh, and most of the time it was very cold. And you, you can imagine a dry, uh, refrigerated environment which has helped to preserve such exquisite uh, colors. Thank you. I would like to announce our next screening, which is from the north. We are going down to the south. It's on 24th of September, and the film is called The Imperial City of Vijayanagara. You might like to mark it in your calendars, and we would love to have you with us once again. And thank you very much, all of you, for being with us on behalf of India Habitat Center and Mr. Binoy Kebehen. Good night, take care, and namaste. And Sushant, thank you very much for uh, the beautiful screening and all your efforts. And my thanks again to India Habitat Center. Thank you. <laughs>